but I'm going to look on it and uh, look on it rather and, uh, <laughs> from a different perspective. You're going to look from it from the perspective of what makes up a, a steward. I don't know if it's that. Yes. Man as a steward. But let me start by praying. Father in heaven, it is all about you, not about myself. I pray now, Father, as we enter your words, that you will baptize me afresh with your wisdom. May we all truly be drawn closer to you as we seek to unravel and speak about this important concept. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let me begin. I like to talk. I don't like to lecture. Now, what is stewardship? Anybody? Someone else is good. Okay, if someone else is good. Anybody else? What is, when you hear stewardship, what comes to mind? Manager? All right, same thing again. Anybody have a, a different spin on it than the regular? How do you say it? How do you personalize stewardship to you personally? Managing your possession in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that is um, <laughs> very important or positive for some kind. Stewardship. I am not in charge. I, I, I belong to somebody, right? I belong to God, right? So, my body, my intellect, everything that I own, I was given to manage over. And I need to manage over it according to um, scripture. Amen. Anybody else? I like that one too. I, I don't mind running up and down, you know. <laughs> I'm young. <laughs> Check. I believe stewardship is the prudent management mm. of the resources that God has placed in my care. Mm -hmm. to serve his children. Amen. Amen. I like that one too. And that's my, that's my uncle for you, Uncle Scott. Uh, he's my, my counselor and an instrumental figure in my life thus far. Even though I was upset with him at one point, he know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but he is. Thank you, Uncle. So this afternoon, one of the bases for me being here is, as you know, I'm from... NCU. I'm a fourth year student in the School of Religion and Theology. Uh, I'm being evaluated as it sways towards practical master. And this is a part of it. Uh, the spiritual release kit couldn't host me because of the, the activities this afternoon. The street meeting, a mega street meeting, and all the churches are gathering on the street. So I am here. And this assignment is due on Monday. But apart from that, I'm here because I'm on the Lord's work. Amen? So, can we have the first slide? Yes, a steward is a person who is manager of another. It's good. A person who is a manager of another's good. Goods. A steward is someone who manages the affair of another. Luke describes a steward as a faithful and wise manager. The manager handles his master's affair while he is away. When the master returns, he praises his manager for his loyalty and praises his manager for his loyalty or chastisement or disloyalty. We must view life then from God's point of view and use his priority in our time, talent, temple, and treasure. That's from the book, Manage Your Resources by S.L. Her. So a steward is essentially a manager. 
someone who takes care of something that belongs to someone else. And from a biblical perspective, we all are stewards whether we like it or not. Because the truth is, nothing we have here belongs to us. Amen. Nothing we have on this earth belongs to us. Not even your own body. It belongs to God. Amen? Amen. Next slide. All right. It's so far away, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm half blind. So who, whose goods are we managing? And we are in the book of Psalms, Psalms 24, verse 1 and 2. It says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. So, as we highlighted before, in order to be a steward, you have to be managing someone else's good. So, and God's, the earth belongs to God. You belongs to God. And everything you possess belongs to God. Next slide. So what is the link between a steward and having dominion? Anybody can tell me that. I don't want to read that yet. What do you think is the link between, between being a steward and having dominion? A steward, a steward has authority to spend and to perform and to do whatever with his master. Because whether good or bad, a steward is, is actually placed in a position to make decision and do it without even consulting the owner. Amen. Amen. I love that. That's us hitting the nail right on the head. Boom. Anybody else? Also, dominion. When Joseph was in um, Egypt, serving as a steward, he also had dominion. Yes, that was given to him by, by Pharaoh, you know. And um, we see in Genesis also, early Genesis, where man was given the same. Amen. That's the text on the screen. I, I'm sorry, so fine and so far away. But it reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and every and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creep upon the earth so god created man in his own image in the image of god he created him male and female he created them as was rightly said a steward has dominion and authority amen yeah. he, he god didn't just say all right take care of the earth and just Whenever you need to do something, um, ask me. <laughs> he gave them dominion and authority. Right? And just like my elder said just now, Joseph is a prime example. Uh, when he was in Egypt and he was summoned by Pharaoh, Pharaoh, recognizing his wisdom and ability, gave him dominion and authority over Egypt to preserve the lives of the Egyptians. Amen? So a steward has dominion and authority. But what do we do with this authority? What, what should we do with it? Next slide. This is seven day, the Bible commentary says, it says the relationship of God to the rest of, the relationship of man to the rest of the creation was to be one of rulership. The use of the plural them shows that God plans planned from the very beginning to create more than one individual by transferring to adam rule over by transferring to adam ruling power over all the earth god planned to make man his representative or viceroy over this planet so the mere fact that we were created in the image of the creator is a, is a, is an evidence enough to say that we were given power to manage this earth. But how should we manage this earth as people of God? <sighs> One of my favorite texts is in Proverbs. I won't tell you right, does it? It's not there yet? No, it's not there. And it speaks of how we treat um, our fellow occupants, animals. And 
I, 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 I personally don't believe that you can be a child of God and be cruel to animals. But I see enough Christians cruel to animals. Even run them over their car. <laughs> Seriously. Is that, is that the kind of dominion that we are supposed to exercise as, as, as towards? Hello? Right, so, so there is a symbiotic relationship between um, man and nature. And if we were to eradicate, and this is why we know we have uh, scientists trying to bring back um, so many different species from the brink of extinction. Because if we were to eradicate any set amount of species, then something else will rise up and take its place and throw everything off balance. So we have that... Really, that, that, that um, responsibility to care for, just as the Bible says, to dress it and keep it and ensure that it continues to, to thrive and to survive harmoniously. Go ahead, my brother. Yes, just to follow up on the, um, <laughs> the, the point of taking care of the animals, you mm -hmm. know, treating them bad. How do you balance that between killing them and eating them? <laughs> God gave us the, 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 the go ahead to do so. <laughs> he, he did say we can, we can kill and eat some of them. <laughs> he did say that. <laughs> yes. Um, also, um, we talk about the environment, being stewards of the environment, mentioned uh, mm -hmm. the animals and so forth. I'm sure if you uh, walk in the street, you will see how the street is littered with mm -hmm. garbage and mm -hmm. such like. So I may go, I may feel hungry mm -hmm. and I just stop at the shop or somewhere and get a meal. Mm -hmm. So I might be in my car just walking along and I just eat what is in the, 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 the box or mm -hmm. what, drink what is in whatsoever. But I just toss it out. Sure. And so what happens there so, because we are not fulfilling the responsibility of being good stewards. Mm -hmm are carrying out our this stewardship, that official role, as mm -hmm. God has in, in, um, indicated, then it even reflects on us, because right now many of the disease, many of the sicknesses that is going around yeah. are coming from that. Uh, also, mm -hmm. our water sources have been contaminated. Sure. Right now it's very unsafe. Some people say, well, this is the best water and thing like that is the mercy. I want to say to everybody, including myself, is the mercy of God why we are not dead already. We're not dead already. <laughs> because um, many of what we thought is the best thing is not really the best thing. So man is irresponsible. And I say, I say also, why would you eat if you if you are you're, you're a friend of God and when you look to see the friend eat out or somebody starts it out like that? Mm -hmm. I would start to think in my head, boy, I would not eat from this person though, because if the person is really handling mm -hmm. the environment so, mm -hmm. then to me, it tells me something about the person that it is unsafe to really trust the person. In certain way. So we need, you know, so these are the little things, little things. in which we really um, failed from carrying out the duty that God has. Amen. You know, once upon a time, I was on a board, um, I won't call it church, because I still love that church, and we had a means of disposing of garbage, and that was to burn it, or to throw it behind the church back and burn it. And as a new Christian, coming in and see that I was very disappointed, and I raised to the church, why can't the church organize for proper garbage, garbage collection, like any other organization? Why do we have to throw it behind the church and burn it? And then we say we are stores, you know? And that is even against the laws of the land, too. 
<laughs> so there are some things we do that we don't pay attention to and we don't recognize that people are watching and saying that you guys are not living. You guys are not living to what you, according to what you're preaching. Because you're saying you're stewards, but you're practicing this kind of lifestyle. Repeat. Explain. Mercy. I was just, I was just saying. I, was just saying <laughs> I learned something. <laughs> I learned something, but I don't think it's, it, it's that justifies the action. No. <laughs> I learned something. I, I like Quest, that Kidron Valley. Question here. Um, due to, we, we talk about dominion. Mm -hmm. Due to the change of the whole thing about after creation, after sin, mm -hmm. how does 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 the um the whole thing of um what we're talking about again um, what the, the topic we're talking about again stewardship stewardship mm -hmm. changes <laughs> don't, don't don't does it change it does. in terms of um when we look at animals we talk we're talking about animals animals come to attack you. Should I, I see in America where, where these people might, might take out a snake out of a... A, 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 a barrel. Yes, and um, the, 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 the snakes are very poisonous. But they would just carry them and just let go them in the wild. But we Jamaican, kill it. we are kill it. So how, how does it change? <laughs> Thank you for the question. It's, it's actually right there in the text. You know, the, text the text says, um, we were created in his image. Right? Let us make man in our own image, says God, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. You see, we were we have a, a, a seminar recently, and we were, the topic was what does it mean to be human? Because we're living in us in, in an age where we're now entering into what we call transhuman, where human beings are no longer fully. You can put chips in your head, and there's a lot of modification. So, what does it mean to be human? And the point was raised that to be human means to reflect God's image. That's how we were created. We were created in his image and his likeness. And so the closer we are to that, that's what it means to be human. So I asked this presenter the question, are you saying that if a person is not in a relationship with God, they are unhuman? And he says, no. But the truth is, the reality is, <laughs> the things that we do as human beings and to each other, it's actually an argument. The farther we, we go away from God, the more unlike humans we are, unlike God we are. And I think that to be human means to be connected with God, according to that text. We are created in his image and his likeness. And God wants to create, recreate in us, oh God, um, that image so we can represent him in a true way. But the truth is, something went wrong, as you said. And we no longer can relate to animals and the environment the way we were created to relate to them. So how do we fix that? God says, God did not give up on us. And I like Genesis 3, chapter, Genesis 3, verse 15. He said, I put enmity between you. And, and further, look into that text. It tells you that if that enmity wasn't placed there, we would have been totally deprived. Nothing to do with God. But, but because God placed that enmity there, we have a desire to reconnect with him. Amen? Amen. All right, let's, let's continue. I think I'm going to jump in the gun a little bit. A little bit. Go ahead, Ella. We're talking about killing animals. Mm -hmm. and All right. Does that apply to pests like rats <laughs> and all those things? Because I have a, I have a quotation here mm -hmm. from Ellen White. Let me read it for you. Go ahead. <laughs> and lizard. He selected messages, book two, page 318 to 320. He says that he says the earth has been cursed because of sin. True. And in these last days, vermin of every kind will multiply. These pests must be killed, or they will annoy and torment every, even kill us and destroy the work of the hands and the fruits of our land. Facts. Sorry. As I said before. The way we're meant to relate to these creatures aren't the same because of sin. And these things can now become 
and hazard to our health. And so in, in order to preserve life and good health, some <laughs> all vampire must die, <laughs> as one person would say. Some creatures have to die to preserve our lives. That's just the sad reality I've seen. Ella. I need a text for that, you know. <laughs> Go ahead, Ella. All right. Um, I, I think part of the problem is 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 also our approach to life. Mm -hmm. Um we 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 have gotten to the stage as human beings where we individually we want to consume too much. So, so we we want to and, and even as a nation, as a as a species, we, we want to consume too much. Mm -hmm. So we keep wanting more, wanting more, wanting more. So the habitat where these animals used to exist don't exist anymore because human beings want to take it over, want to, to sure. live there, want to destroy it. So these, even as Elijah was talking about the snake and the house and, mm -hmm. and these type of things, if you, if, you, if you go into an area and clear away all the trees and the shrubs and put up concrete and wood and all of these things then where do we ex expect them to live sure where do we expect them to exist they are supposed to just move out of that area sure. so when we go in and consume all of these areas they have nowhere to go Welcome. except to come to, to what we have built yes true. and 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 we destroy their food sources so they have to feed on the food that we provide that sure. we have that is why we have animals eating our plants and these things because we have destroyed the natural habitat. True. And so the habitat that we create, they have to exist True. in that because they have to exist also. True. It's not like they can just disappear and move on to some to somewhere else. Amen. Amen. And and, and if you if, if you want to go that level um to say that if there are a problem, get rid of them. Um from a social socialist perspective, um the one of the biggest problems this herd faces human beings. <laughs> <laughs> we are even worse than some of these. No, probably, probably we're the worst pests. Some people say to the earth. S one person even said some of the, the, some of the most beautiful areas on earth are areas where human beings have not yet inhabited. So it's 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 learning to it's learning to coexist with our fellow inhabitants. All right, um, Proverbs twelve verse ten. I think it's can move that slide now. Slide seven. It says, Whoso is righteous has regard for the life of beasts, but the, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. <laughs> Whoso is righteous, Whoso is righteous has regard for the life of beasts, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. So the Bible says that the righteous man as a regard for the creatures around him. While it is a fact that these things do affect our lives, it's not for us to go out and annihilate them because the truth is we need them as much as they need us. And if we get, to, uh, get rid of all the animals, I, I, I believe strongly that we're going to feel the repercussions of that. I remember once we went to Mangabush, me and my brother, Mangabush, we call it, yes. And <laughs> we broke up in our ants nest, right? Big tall mountain of an ants nest. And my brother went back home and boiled a, a pot of water and got thrown in the asset. And I was so upset about it. I was so upset. I said, Why, what, did, what did they do to you for you to go there and kill them? And my brothers also love to shoot birds. I never shoot birds. I, I, I think it's a wicked act. If, if I'm going to eat it, then I shoot it. But you just shoot the bird for shooting sake. What, 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 you know? Boys will be boys. <laughs> but I wasn't that kind of boy. I, I felt it was cruel to just shoot an animal just because it's for sport. It's not, it's not nice. It's not nice. How would you like if somebody shoot you for sport? <laughs> and, and, and yes, this, there's something that... Is an animal a soul? I have a lot of scholars in here. Is an animal a soul? Is an animal a soul? Facts. Some people don't believe that. Some people don't believe that. And I think that contributes to the way they treat animals. Moving on. 
But even though we say animal is a soul, the life of an animal is not the life of a human being. Facts. So the, the, the most persons I would see, um, most persons love their dogs. Mm -hmm. Love their dogs. They would spend millions of dollars if they have it. I see people now cloning their dogs. They love the dogs, sure. but they are spending millions of dollars to clone their dogs, mm -hmm. to ha have them, and doing all of this stuff. But even though God asks us to take care of the animal, God expects us to take care of another human being more exactly. than the animal. Exactly. So we must balance it out. So even though the animal is a soul, it's not like a little child. It's not like, it's so not like man. So if you are going to spend money, thousands and thousands of dollars on your dog, Mm -hmm. And your neighbor's child is hungry, and you know the child is hungry. Mm -hmm. The Bible said to the him that know it good and do it not, to him it is sin. Amen. And if, if you want biblical evidence for that, the, the, the same word that, that says man is a living soul was the same word that is used in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew to say nefesh. So. I was just going to offer a text. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 19 says, For that which befall it the sons of men, befall it beasts, even one thing befall it them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast for all his vanity. In a fish. That's it. But as Ralph said before, and established in Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, we were created in the image and likeness of God. That's the distinction. Image and likeness of God, and we are intelligent beings. Moving on uh, to the next slide. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and to keep it. To work and to keep it. Some people relate to work as it's, it's, a, it's a consequence of sin. <laughs> <laughs> like I wish I want to go to heaven and rest. I'm tired of staying down here. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> work is something that was given to us as punishment. But the Bible says otherwise. Adam, in his perfect state, was given work. Right? Work. God said you must work and keep it. So work is not a curse. It's actually a blessing. Amen? Go ahead. <laughs> she was supposed to be his helpmate to stand beside him and work. Work with him. Yeah. Yes, man. So, uh, at, what, at, what, at what point did we get the idea that the, the wife should be at home? It depends on what you, you call work. If it's, it, work is not, in my opinion, work is not just going out and 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 and, and one of the hardest work is staying at home. All right. So, <laughs> the, the, is, is, some people say it's the hardest work. <laughs> the, the, reason, the, the reason I ask the question you know, is because both were given similar jobs. Yeah. He was in the garden and she was supposed to be helping out with what he was doing. Yes. Right. But that was before she became a mother. Mm. So, I guess when she became, when she had children now, mm -hmm. Her thing wouldn't be so much helping him out in the garden. Um, for argument's sake, if there were no sin mm -hmm. and she had children, she would still need to be taking care of the little one while he is doing whatever he was doing. And helping her taking care of the little one. And also. helping, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I learned that from Mrs. Scott. <laughs> I should say that. <laughs> you, it is not, it's not okay for. The man to be working and the woman to be working, and you leave all the household responsibilities upon her. Because she's helping you, providing for the family, you must help her also in the house. Right, Mr. Scott? Amen. I learned that. I'm not forgetting that. <laughs> all right, moving on. The next slide. I want us to read Genesis 3, verse 6 to 7, and verse 15. I want us to read those texts. Genesis 3. Verse 6 to 7 and verse 15. Are we there? 
verse 6 and 7 and 15. You can go ahead. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took off the fruit thereof and did eat, mm. and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Mm -hmm. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves aprons. Mm. Can you pause for a while? Pause for a while. This is something that is very important for me in stewardship. <laughs> stewardship is choosing to do the master's will. So even though we established at the beginning that a steward is given authority and dominion, it is not for them to do what they feel like doing. A true steward is going to execute his master's will. It's not your company. So if you're given the responsibility to be the manager, it's not your call to say you're going to lead the company in that direction. You are supposed to execute the policy of that company, right? If you go against the policy of the company, I, I'm almost certain that the, the CEO is going to fire you. And it's the same thing with God. Even though he bestowed us with um, authority and dominion, and he won us back that dominion, it is our responsibility to choose to do His will. Say your hand. All right, but what if there's a shortfall in a certain area? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the master said to do it this way, but there's a shortfall. Do you have liberty now to do it another way? Definitely. Definitely. Because this master is not a, is not a once... It, it, it's, it's in the parable of a talent and it's coming up. Even though he bestowed you with one talent, he's not expecting you to just remain at one level. He's expecting you to multiply, to invest, to go out and find opportunities to make the companies better, company better. But it's, it's that vision statement. You must stick to that vision statement and aim of the company while expanding the company. And he's going to be happy. So it's not for you to just stick... And, uh, uh, let me say this carefully. Don't be narrow-minded. You know, explore, develop, um, expand. Uh, there, there are some churches in the Seventh Avenue Church right now where they would have been blessed 50 years ago with a piece of property. And the church is growing, and because they are so narrow-minded, they don't want to move. Seriously. Like, what is wrong with moving and, and growing the church? But they just want to stay here because this is our heritage and it's our roots. God doesn't have another problem with you buying another piece of property and expanding this church. Something like that. Go ahead. <laughs> I think I agree with you in that when, when, um, when God was giving Adam instructions in terms mm -hmm. of to dress the garden, he didn't say, do it this, do it this, that way. He, mm. gave, them, he gave him the, um, the, what do you call it now? Li yeah. Yes. Free will. The, the free yes. will, the freedom. What's the other word again? Autonomy. autonomy. Yes, that's the word, autonomy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the autonomy to, to do, you know, but it's still within, as you say, within God's will. Yes, yeah. within his will. The, the Bible says, and the, 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 the Bible says, Cain was a steward, mm. and so was Abel. Mm -hmm. They were both stewards. Mm hmm and God gave them direction as it relates to worship. Mm. Cain worship one way, mm -hmm. and Abel worship one way. <laughs> Today, God gave direction to worship. And the same thing happening. We are here today. Tomorrow, there'll be another group of worship. Yeah. And Cain said his way of doing it was the right way. Yeah. And Abel said his way was the right way. If you ask the Adventists, the Seventh-day Adventists, they'll tell you Saturday yes. is the day to worship. And if you ask the Moravian and the Pentecostal, they'll tell you tomorrow is the day to worship. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the question is, right? Should we follow? 
and you, you are al al alluded to that. Should we follow the blueprint, the guidelines? If we vary, how far should we go away from that? Mm. Because that's a real issue. Sure. Because the farer we go to the left, is a less as sure to reflect the character of God. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very, very careful that we don't bring as sure into the management of God's property, our own beliefs, our sure. own um, views and things, mm -hmm. but follow the blueprint. Somebody says, somewhere in the Bible says, God means what he says. And he says, says what, what he, he means. means. If God says seven, seven ones, it won't do. Or the first won't do. Sure. Follow what God says. Man shall not be by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I see your hand first then. When we look at true stewardship, let us look at a, a post sin stewardship situation with Abraham. Abraham's steward. And was not only responsible for finding Abraham's son a wife, but the deal was if there was nobody to gain the inheritance, it belonged to him. It belonged to Eliezer, the inheritance. So he could have done things to mash up the situation so to benefit him. So the true steward, even though it will benefit you, you have to think of what, who you are working for, who, are, who is in charge of you. So that, and that's how you would say um, the unselfishness comes in, where even uh, you are taught you won't stray away from the mandate as you were talking about. Even though you know you would benefit from it, you have to stick to what is best for your master. The, uh, all right. Um, Love that. I have always advocated for the, the principle but the methodology can change. You take away my thought. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> God says, listen, the Sabbath is the day that you should worship. Yes. But he didn't say, you have to come to church at 9.15 and you have to have Sabbath school, divine service. We orchestrated the, 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 farm. the worship the way how we wanted. Yes. How we are comfortable, how we are... Mm -hmm. How, how we are able to manage. Liturgy, we yes. have Bible class and AY that is, that is manageable. Mm -hmm. but, but God says worship, as a matter of fact, if you, the Bible says of Jesus that he went into the temple and spoke. That's right. There, there is no account of, of singing, but I'm sure they had singing. Sure. So, so the, the, the format of, of service, and I'm sure that they didn't um, probably... In, in Sister White's time, this probably wasn't how they had service, True. like how we have service today. So the, the, the principle always stay the same, and that's what the stewards are. That's what the stewards we need to recognize. Principles what is the principle? Yeah. And it's the same thing when, 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 this, when the master went away and he gave one five and gave one three and gave one one, he didn't say, listen, your responsibility is to do this and your... This is the talent that you have been given. Mm -hmm. Your responsibility, the only responsibility you have is to manage the one that you have been given. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go, you didn't have to, you don't have to go, go, um, buy and sell with it. Mm -hmm. Any, how you manage it, as long as you manage it responsibly, mm -hmm. that is up to you. Mm -hmm. And that's why the, the one that buried it <laughs> said, boy, I know my master. <laughs> Mercy. So the, 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 the principle is what the steward recognizes because the master has given the freedom mm -hmm. to say, listen, execute, just execute. But remember, the principle has to be kept. Yeah. Within a, within a standard also, you know, because even though there's a principle, as you rightly said, there's a, there's, a, there's a way that God wants it to be executed. Like, for instance, that's something that must be present is reverence. You can't just worship God any and any way you feel like worshiping God. There must be an, it must be an attitude of reverence. So there's a, there are some things that he requires. As was said before, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So that's something where, even though I agree with you, the persons who worship on Sunday said, 
The first is just a day. I'm still worshiping God. So there are some, there are some standards that he wants to, 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 to remain. You know, there are leeways, of course, in terms of, leeway in terms of how we worship, but not outside that about the principle of reverence to God and respect to God. Could we look at, at, at this whole issue as a company? And um, we know, the, we know the, the mission statement of the company. Mm -hmm. and, and um, the person who was the company, mm -hmm. we know his name. Mm -hmm. So, all right. We are asked to operate in line with his mission statement, mm -hmm. his character. Mm -hmm. So, so if you're supposed to file your taxes... The, 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 the first of April. Mm -hmm. He always does that. True. So you running his company now, you can't go decide some I'm not filing um exactly first of April. Me, me choose one next day. Exactly. And um if if he said you you're supposed to get X amount of percent of a raise for each worker, you can't just go give workers any amount of raise where you feel you're supposed to operate within the guideline. I like the word you use character. I like the word character right there. And, 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 and where can we find a transcript of God's character? The Ten Commandments. <laughs> I just want to put this one thing in. I just want to put this one thing. God is very precise, you know. Very. When I studied the book of Leviticus and mm -hmm. Exodus, <laughs> even the departing words... God told Moses what he should say. True. We say it in church now, but that was what God told Moses. Moses, when the people are leaving, this is what you must say. Cain, Abel, I want a lamb. It mm -hmm. must have blood. Not apples. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine Abel maybe had a small lamb. Nice little lamb. But Cain get maybe the biggest fruit that he could find. <laughs> but God didn't ask for that. Exactly. And throughout the scripture, God is very, very precise. He's exact when it comes to how his people should worship. True. Right? And as we've been saying, um, anything you do, you must reflect the character of God. Amen. That is the key thing. Amen. The character of God must be reflected. People must know that you're a Christian, not just a steward. You're a seven-day Adventist Christian managing God's property. Amen. Amen. But and, and with that said also, as Ella rightly said, there's still room for flexibility. There's still yes. room to grow. Because when God tell Abraham, go and sacrifice your, your son, that was against everything that he was taught, you know. And, but he, Abraham had to be obedient enough to say, I trust that his God was leading me. So sometimes God can go outside of the box of, of the, 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 the letter that we operate in and say, execute this in for my name's sake. And as you rightly said, uncle, it, it's within a framework. God wants us to operate in a particular framework, and that's clearly established in Scripture. Running along, the next slide says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, else he will hold to one and despise the other. He can serve God and mammon. Next slide. Ellen White has something to say about it. He says, many of God's people, I love this word, listen to this word, are stupefied. <laughs> many of God's people are stupefied by the spirit of the world. And are denying their faith by their works. They cultivate a love for money, for house and land, until it absorbs the power of mind and being, and stop and shut out love for the Creator and and for souls whom God, who Christ died for. <laughs> Seventh Adventists. One one of the things I admire about the Seventh Adventist Church is this. The principle in which we live our lives. If I wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist, I would have been a Rasta man. Nothing like. I'd have been a Rasta man. And I used to love this song. Simplicity we use to survive. Many find it difficult because they're ignorant and die. So I used to love that because 
I think that's a better way to live life. And Seventh-day Adventist has that principle. I love that. But the truth is we have gone astray and we are, we are so focused on the farm, Ella, and we forget the principle. What is the principle behind simplistic living? We, we, so, we, we focus so much on jewelry. <laughs> and that, that seems to, in our limited understanding, to encapsulate what simple, simple living is like. It's true, the pioneer is pointed to that. But there's so much things we are doing that is not simple living. That we could be so, do so much more for the kingdom of God. But because we're not following the principle, but we're more infatuated with the, with the farm and the nail polish and the jewelry, we forgot that we are people of simple living. It's in the manual. You can read it. Simple living. But I find, don't, don't get hurt, no, you know, but I find people of God are having six, seven cars. We are doing six, seven cars. Is that simple living? I know a Hilda's with them, like six, seven car, expensive car. I know a Hilda. He was very humble, not calling him name. He used to drive a Mitsubishi. I remember he said in a, in a Bible class, I will never drive a BMW, you know, big BMW. He said, because I can't afford it. Two years after, what is he driving? <laughs> and he said in a Bible class, he said in the Bible class, um, one tire on the BMW Hilda can buy four tires for his Mitsubishi. And he said in the Bible class, that is why he's not going to buy it. And guess what he's driving now? BM. <laughs> no, the BMW. <laughs> so, I, I, again, we are so caught up in the farm. But the principle, miss it. Go ahead, Ella. We talk about simplicity. Mm -hmm. And um, at our churches, should we just been simple where we have some wooden benches where them oh. squeeze you mm. or, 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 or you don't have any fan heat killing you. <laughs> yeah, like so so, so <laughs> you, you must just be simple. You know? It's not, it's and, not and you don't have any any amplified sound that all. people down here can't I hear you. Know? Out my mama, my <laughs> so so what simplicity mean? It, it, it's, it's, it's living to contribute to the kingdom of God. It's, not, it's using the resources to glorify God. So whatever, whatever glorifies God, that's what the pioneers were, were, were alluding to. A lifestyle that glorifies God. All right. It's um, not excessive. Okay. Let me clarify something then. All right. I understand yes, the simplicity. Mm -hmm. And I understand the guy with the Mitsubishi. <laughs> 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 but listen, uh, suppose, suppose I, personally, then, um, I'm very rich. Mercy. I'm not rich in them, but assume that I'm rich. Yes. <laughs> I'm very rich. I have seven cars. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, invest in some apartments and all that. All right. But at the same time, I'm contributing to God's work. Mm. A lot. You know, in, in, I contribute to the church, helping the poor and all of this. Um, what are these guys? Abraham, how many camels he had? That's a, lot, that's a lot of BMWs, you know. Mercy. Brother <laughs> 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 Job, yeah. Well. Job, Job's a rich guy, you know. How many camels he had? <laughs> yeah, man. That's an X5, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so explain that. I don't know. I just want... If we, one if, one if of if the I'm identifying re marks... <laughs> one of the identifying marks of the remnant church is the gift of prophecy. Amen. And there are times when God instructs his prophet to, to lead his people in a particular direction. Especially given the fact that Abraham, Job, and those other pioneers were not living in the last days. And they did not have this present truth that we have now. So there, there are different, what's the word? Dispensation, I'm not dispensationalist now. And God people are called to live a, different, a particular way. So if God, it's, it's like when God said to, 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 to Jacob and his family, get away with the, with the foreign gods and come and, and sanctify yourself and come to me. Get away with the, the jewelry and the, you know, take them off and come worship me in sincerity. So the, the different times, different era, different means. And I, and I truly don't believe that pilgrims should be um, building castles on, on the land and they're, they're just passing through. Uh, if you're a pilgrim, you're on the move. You're getting ready to leave this earth behind. Good evening, everyone. Am I to understand that um, as Christian, you're not supposed to be wealthy? 
No. Because um, wealthy and having money is a good it, thing. It, 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 I, I think it's a good thing. Yes. Once you're using whatever you have, you're not selfish with whatever you have, and you shared whatever you have. There's nothing wrong. Because when you read the Bible, you have a lot of wealthy people there. Abraham, J Job, and all those people were very rich, but they weren't selfish. Exactly. They share what they have. And sometimes we're in church now, and um, we have what we have, but we're not willing to share. Somebody come to you and ask for stuff, and you have it, you know. But they think it's hard to share True. with each other. I want to read this week's lesson and tell you about um, the, back in the days, the early church, how they live, and everybody was coming. You know, mm -hmm. I'm really hoping that we'll get to live that day before Amen. Jesus comes. Nobody better, you know, just share whatever you have. I said, sell whatever you have, and nobody in wants. That's what I want to see before this time. Too. Amen. Well, it, it, to be rich means you have to have a lot of spiritual maturity to be rich, you know. <laughs> you have to be a lot of spirit because you can come to a point where like the rich and ruler you, you recognize in your life that you're missing something and you're like God I'm doing so much already I, know I don't need to do anymore and God wants to take you to another level but you're like no I, I'm, I'm doing enough I don't need to do anymore I'm, I'm already, I already have six companies so many employers I just want to live it up now and put my foot up and relax and Jesus said to the man that built the barn up and, and stroke up his, 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 his goods and said, okay, Mr. Barn man, I forgot the, I forgot the text right here. You're dead today. How for the goods then? Who does it belong to? You die. So, mm -hmm. I know we, 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 we keep alluding to how rich um, some of these Bible characters were. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the responsibility and the call is different. Mm -hmm. if, we, if, we, if we looked at Job's time and the, the little knowledge that the Bible gave us about Job, mm -hmm. the need wasn't so great as it is now. Yeah. And when we, when, we, when, we, when we as a church know, if we, we have a beautiful edifice right here. Yeah, it is. And, and the breeze is nice. Sometimes in spiritual you have to close. And, and we go decide now that, okay, we want to put in AC. Mercy. That's, that's excessive. Mm. That's not unnecessary. When that money, there are so many people out there that is, that is in need. I get you. The need is, is, is great. Yeah. And, and even if you say that you are wealthy and you can afford to give, how much more can you give? Mm. Because there, 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 there is no giving that can that can quantify the need. Mm -hmm. There is always that need. And even though we, we always, Sister Carl and I always joke and say, um, the poor will always be with us. Yeah. And that is true. But the need is also there. Exactly. And if you, think, if you think you are doing enough by giving a hundred, <laughs> there are still persons out there that would take a hundred more. Amen, 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 amen. And that's going back to the rich young ruler situation scenario. He, he was doing so much, but he still felt he, he lacked something. God was saying, sell everything. Give to the poor and come follow me. You know, I think there is always this tension in, with Seventh-day Adventists about works and faith. And we, we look at wealth on one end. But there is this tension that we feel that to gain heaven, we have to make ourselves suffer. On this earth, there is this <laughs> tension that you must enjoy <laughs> life, creation, yeah, God's creation, because if you enjoy it too much, you might miss out. You might miss out on heaven. <laughs> so there is this constant tension. That's true. But if we if we look at Brother Price mentioned Job, one of the things Job was lamenting, Job Job said that he personally, not his servant, mm -hmm. Job was saying that he personally every night. He said he has not gone to sleep mm. until he figured out all the widows mm. and the offer in his surrounding were fed. And that's why you mean, he remained wealthy because of that. Right. And he did that, he did that nightly. And, and, and when um, it's, it is said of Nicodemus mm -hmm. that Nicodemus was so wealthy that he could feed and finance Jerusalem for a solid year, yeah. he alone. And Sister White said Nicodemus made himself poor for the cause of God. Wow. So it, it doesn't matter. I, I don't think it matters so much how much money you have. Because I guarantee you, a man will go to hell 
holding on to his $100. Mm -hmm. Just as much as the man will go holding on to his millions. Mm -hmm. It's the attitude, that, the attitude, it is the attitude that you have. Amen. And, and I think we must look at God as a just God. I always Amen. say this. Look at God as a just God. God says, he says, if you're faithful mm -hmm. and you work honestly and hard, I am going to reward your endeavor. Amen. That's what he says. If you work hard and you're faithful in your tithes and offering, I'm going to reward your, your endeavor. So a person works hard. And then we tend to look at persons who are not Christian mm -hmm. and thinking th that this thing only goes for Christian. But the person who is not a Christian, the person works hard and he works honestly. Mm -hmm. And you see a reward for his labor. Yeah. Now, when we want money to finance the cause of God, what do we do? We bring cards and we say, go and beg that man. Because we think if we work hard mm -hmm. and honestly and you get enough, maybe <laughs> you will not be in heaven. Mercy. <laughs> so we must think of these things. If, if we had money in spiritually to do evangelism, how we want to do evangelism, to help the poor. Mm. So it, it would work out better. Amen. 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 Love the points. You know, um, being steward and the conference will always, their um, representative will always come to church is and do their thing. But I remember the first time I went down to Nottingham. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm telling you. I, I said to one member, how long have you been here? <laughs> Donkey's ears. And I believe that God is displeased and I believe that down there in Nottingham and the condition under which God's people, the few of God's people is worshiping down there is an indictment on Central Jamaica Conference. Wow. It's a shame and a disgrace. Wow. And I believe that I personally can do something and I, I you know, I don't want to say what I have done or tried to do, but, you know, they are managing God's money. Sure. How can you let me tell you, brethren, I don't know how brethren at Spiritry feel if you have not, not known nothing how and gone to see how those humble brethren down there is worshipping. It breaks your heart, man. And that church will, that little gathering there of faithful people will not grow because you have people who want to come to worship, but they see themselves and they will not go in there to sit in that little mm. shock you would call it and, and, and worship brethren. Is it's a part of this district? Huh? It's a part of this district. Mm -hmm. And a conference, I'm saying, and you can put me on record, Central Jamaica Conference should be ashamed of themselves. Shame to dress up in jacket and tie and have those walking about and have those people worshiping down there in that condition. Mm. It's a disgrace, man. Please. Sometime I'm going back to the to, to, to um just draw an illustration. Say you have KFC Wendy's or any one of those and they mm -hmm. them sell out franchises. Mm -hmm. So they would never let one of their branches yeah. don't keep up to the standard of their um company thing mm. and i believe that as towards we should operate in such a way that we maintain a level but sometimes we talk about simplicity and um the, the whole thrust of evangelism mm -hmm. and many times when, when when we find like nottingham and where spiritually was before before the church, it is a principle that we should not organize 
on lease land. Mm -hmm. You should organize on your own land. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the, um, the, the things that, that happens to Nottingham where the land is not theirs. Yeah. So, so I believe we should try to manage God's resources, resources in a way that it will not bring reproach to God, yeah. upon the name of God. Yeah. It's something that I'm passionate about also. Um, I won't comment on the conference. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, as Elder, I see you, Elder Zan. Uh, I admire the, the Jehovah Witnesses. Yeah, man. They, they, all the churches look alike and represent a particular image. I like that. And I think we need to get to a stand. That's all I would say. We need to get to that part where the Seventh Avenue Church is recognized for a particular standard of, of structure and worship because this is his sanctuary, reverence is sanctuary. Ella. Um, Elder, I don't know. From I was a teenager in the Adventist Church. I've been always reprimanded by the elders mm. because I always say to them, I want to be rich. <laughs> And they'll quote out of context a number of texts to me. Mercy. <laughs> and when they finish, I said, I still want, want to, to be rich. <laughs> so I was always seen as a rebellious youth growing up. Mercy, and look at you But now. the truth is, is, the Bible says, God's desire for his children is that we are prosperous. Amen. We Amen. are healthy. So... What stewardship is it, you know, Elder? Is the careful, the prudent management exactly. of what is given to mm -hmm. us. Exactly. exactly. God give you the, the, the gift of being a lawyer. You must be the best lawyer, Sister best Carla one. would want me to say. You are so good that everybody come to you. And you win all the cases and you get all the resources. Um... I, I was reading about Dr. Days, who is from the hills in St. Andrew. And the church elder saw that he was a good boy and bright. And he said they took off their hat and collect offering. Send him to Kingsway. Amen. Send him to West Indies College Amen. that you're attending now. Mm -hmm. He graduated, went to U.S., and he studied again to be a doctor, neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. He had the Lama Linda University, that department there. Amen. And was number 10 in the world. Wow. When Hurricane Gilbert came and it blew off the rooftop, he just came down. That's simple. <laughs> and just been up at the church. Give Amen. everybody $10,000 in the district. Go and buy seeds and start again. Wow. He sent a number of you to... Um, um, Kingsway High School to West Indies College. West Indies College. <laughs> yes. So my thing has always been, I would wish to God, yeah. if if there are one hundred members in the church, that ninety are rich. Amen. So so that we can, you, people can realize that being a Christian doesn't mean that. You, you're poor. You can't buy your sugar. Mm -hmm. You can't buy your bread. We can't dress properly to church. No. Poverty and Christianity have nothing in common. <laughs> so, in other words, the Bible said God gave Elder one man one gift, one talent. He gave one three and one five. So, therefore, what God expects, this man must have one house. Mm -hmm. This one has three apartments, <laughs> and this one has five. Amen. And, Amen. It, and it continues in all things. So, that, so, so he said, double it, and it must keep multiplying. Amen. And that you use it to serve God's children. Amen. That is prudent management. Amen. I think I'm getting the signal to wrap up. I, don't, I think AY is almost ready. Um, Ella, then I do my closing statement.
while it is while, 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 while it is true and it is it is nice first of all i don't believe that we can safely say the seventh day adventist church is poor i'm not i've been to several seventh day adventist church and i would say i might be wrong on this but more than 90 percent of the members live above poverty mm-hmm. in the seventh day adventist church Mm-hmm. And it, it, it depends on our definition of riches. It depends on our definition of riches when we say um, riches and wealth and these things. It depends on our definition because I don't think I am poor. I work hard. And I don't think I am poor. I have, I have a house. I, my wife drives a car. We, we have cars. Our kids go to good school. I'm not poor. We have clothes. So I, I don't think I don't think I am poor. But but my question is, what else would it take for me to be to be rich? What do I need to achieve to say that I am rich? That is, that would be my question. Mm. So I think it's a personal it, it, thing though. Exactly. <laughs> so so riches for me might be different um than riches for El- just like success is defined differently for each person. Exactly. So, so, so we can't just generally say um, God wants us to be rich or God is desires for us to be prosperous. But, there, but there, it depends. There's, there's a, you started off by using a standard to say, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you, you're, you're, you're making that assumption based upon what society defines as poor. Society also defines a level where a man becomes rich. So in the same sense that you're saying most of us are not poor because of that standard, we're living above, so we can, we can buy something and eat and we can be satisfied. There's a standard also where society says that this man is rich once he's passed that standard. Yeah, but is that the standard then that we are going for? Is that the standard then we are going for where society says, okay, you have eight car and eight, six houses and that then you are rich? Is that the standard? So we, we have to ask ourselves, what is it? What is it that I that when I achieve I can say I am rich? It it, it is as Ella Scott said. There, there's nothing wrong with being having capital, but, and, but and, it's how you use it. And let me just add this too: we have had countless examples. Yeah, I'm we have had countless that. examples of individuals who got rich and turned their backs on God. <laughs> countless examples, and I believe I might be wrong on this. But I believe that God does that God does not grant some of us. Some of us work hard. Mm-hmm. Some people work very hard, but they're not rich. Mm-hmm. Are they not? They 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 they're making it. But if they should get riches, God knows the heart. Mm-hmm. God exactly. has to keep some of us humble. Exactly. And whether we accept it or believe it or, or not, it is the truth. True. God has to keep some of us humble because if some of us achieve what we want to achieve what our hearts desire, then we will turn our back on God. True. True. Ella, I don't want you to help me with something. I want you to help me. You can move? No? Yes, yes. I want you to help me with something. As I close. AY time, right? Go to slide number 12, please. And we close with that slide. Can you just... Record this closing scene for me. Yeah, that's all. It's video here. Yes, yeah, so I can give to my professor that I was here. <laughs> that's all. All right, so we close off with this state. Hmm? Hmm? We are streaming now? Well, I'm made by YouTube. <laughs> all right, though, so it's good then. No problem. No problem. Mercy. No, not no, no, no. Thank you, thank you so much for that. It's a good thing I didn't know I wouldn't be so myself. <laughs> All right, so we close, we close with this statement by Ellen White. She says, "Lay up your treasures beside the throne of God. Do by doing with His entrusted capital, the work that He desires done in the winning of souls to the knowledge of the truth." This will secure your eternal riches. And that, that just seals it off. What does it mean to be a steward? It's a prudent 
management of resources that doesn't belong to us, that belongs to God. And I believe as Christians, rich or poor, if, if the Bible says where your, where your treasures is, there your art is also. And I'm going back to where I began. It should not be that the Seventh-day Adventist church is struggling with offering, which is an expression of gratitude to God. It says a lot. Either it's saying that I don't trust those who are above with the management of this resource, or it's saying to God, I am not grateful for what you have done to us, for us. The offering is an expression of gratitude to God. That's why he didn't give you a stand, a, a, a quota. He didn't say 10 nor 30. As much as you have received, you know, freely give. That you freely shall give. And, and to end with this, God's mathematics is simple. The more you give, the more you receive. And this is a principle that even those in the corporate world are, exam are using. They know that in order to become a successful businessman, you have to be willing to give. You have to be willing to become a servant. And that's why it's sad to say most of Jamaicans are not so successful because the Chinese man has this principle, you know. They want to give. They want to give, but we just want to receive. The more you give people, the more you will receive. I think we can end with that, and I'm going to invite us to stand as we pray. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we pause to say thank you this afternoon for being with us as we discussed a very familiar but important topic of stewardship. Father, we all are stewards, whether we like it or not. But the answer is, will you say to us, well done, good and faithful servant, steward, or will you say, depart from me because I know you not? Father, the desire of us here this afternoon, all of us here this afternoon, is not to be bad stewards, but to effectively and prudently manage that which you have blessed us with, including our bodies, including the knowledge that you have blessed us with. Father, we have called, been called at a time like this, not to live luxuriously, but to call a dying world to a saving savior. We have been given a mandate to share the three angels' message, to tell people, man, boy, woman, and girl, to fear God and glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And the only way we can effectively do that, O oh Father, is if we effectively contribute to your cause. Help us, O oh God, to recognize the time we're living in and to give to your call, your cause as we prepare for your return. Because you promise us in your word, this gospel shall be preached to all the earth, then shall the end come. Help us, O oh God, to fulfill that promise by giving liberally to your cause, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for the opportunity to share. I think I learned a lot. I know I learned a lot this afternoon. <laughs> Thanks. All right, we want to express our thanks to Ella Lawrence for a good presentation. It was a good presentation. Very interactive, very thought out. And we're happy we have had some... All right, I won't go there. But we are happy, we are grateful. Thank you for coming and sharing with us. And um, I don't want to say... The door is always open, but we will definitely talk about future things, about future things. And who knows, I might not be around, but one day you might be back here standing in the pulpit differently. So we are happy that we could have accommodated you. And I want to say thanks to Ella Cockett for allowing his space to be used. That's the man behind you whose space... Um, you used this afternoon. All right. I am going to turn over now to Sister Williams and Sister Edwards, who will be taking us through the time we have left. And they will tell you exactly what their 
they are up to, what their proposals are, and what we will be doing. Okay, good afternoon, AYs. Indeed, it was a wonderful a Bible study. You know, it is good to sit and discuss in an intelligent way the things of God and what God requires of you. Now, you, it is very strange for me to be up here for AY. So I know you're looking at me and wondering what we are coming with. But I'm glad to see so much of us because I want to interest all of us in an interesting project we, have, we are launching this evening. Now, but bef before we, I go into the project, you know, the world is a strange place. Some of the time I watch the news. I'm a news junkie. I watch the news. I read the paper. I watch news all over the world. I constantly do this, and I find that everything is so, is condensing so much that it seems as if our entire lives can be on a device of this size and our information and our this and our that and we lose individuality I think sometimes because of this not it's not bad I'm not saying it is bad but because everything is so wrapped up in technology we we tend to be losing the how how uh, this the joy of actually reading a book um, my, I always tell people when I was going to school, you know what my continuous fantasy was? I always, when I was going to school, dream of being locked in a library all night. That was my fantasy. I wanted somebody to lock me in a library and forget that I was there all night, that I could read. I, I, I could read at one point. I would read anything. But I would read anything. I would read the the labels on the shampoo and the tissue paper and everything, even the bathroom, I would read constantly. I always love to read. And I want to introduce us to the idea of reading again, of reading again. Um, it is a pleasant, pleasant pastime, and it's something you can do in quietness. You can, when you take up a book, you can go somewhere very quiet, and you can sit and read. So this evening, we are launching our book club our book club, and we have a very interesting book we are going to start with. I guarantee you are going to enjoy it. But before we get into that book, I'd just like to invite you to stand and turn to the hymn number 185, which is, Jesus is all the world to me. Sister Alia, who is this singer, can help me with that one. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend in trial sore. I go to him for blessings and he gives them more and more. Beauty of the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain. Harvest of grain. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. And true to him I'll be. Oh, how could I this friend deny when he's so true to me? Following him, I know I'm right. 
He watches o'er me day and night, following him by day and night. He is my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. That has no end, eternal life, eternal joy. He is my friend. Amen. Keep standing. And because Jesus is our friend, we want to know more about him. So you're going to turn your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. And we will read together. And it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you've brought us here this evening. This afternoon, we're so thankful for your love and your grace, and we're thankful for your words that you have given us as we're about to launch this book club, dear Lord, because we believe that there is merit in what you have sent for us to know about your son and his life and his death and his ministry for us. We ask that you might be with us, that you might inspire our hearts to yearn deeper for more of Christ, to understand him and his love for us so much more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so as you might have guessed, since we're looking into the life of Christ and his love and his ministry for us, what book do you think we're thinking about to start our book club with? Absolutely. May I see the hands of those who have read The Deserve Ages? And for me, reading also includes listening to it on audiobook. Gives Auntie Carla side eye. Yeah. <laughs> and it has been a blessing to me. And you see the word of God and what he has given us. When you go over it and you go over it again, you keep. Oh. You see people that have their glasses need to wear it so that they can see smaller words. Um, but yes, the word of God, you just learn more and more of Christ. So even if you've gone through it before, and I have gone through it before, there's much more that we can learn of Christ, much more that we can extract. Okay, so let us discuss what do you know about the desire of ages? The, it, it said that the desire of ages, Sister Ellen, Ellen White, start writing this book in 1858. She began writing, writing The Desire of Ages. Uh, at the time, she, she said that she wrote it following her visit to Lovett Grove, Ohio, where many scenes of the age-long conflict between Christ and Satan were revealed to her in a vision. This is the beginning of the book. She said, in 1876 and 1877, Ellen Wright rewrote and enlarged her narrative on the life of Christ and, and so that the work were com now comprised of 640 pages. And then she add unto it, and it, the, the desire of ages, I should tell you, uh, where if you read the uh, desire of ages and the Acts of the Apostles and Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. It, it, it actually, how she wrote so much that they were actually in one volume. And then she, they separated them. It said, if you should see, I'm going to give heading, give you something. It said, heading, Jesus Christ, uh, discipline, it's a biography. Call number or physical location. 
BT301, W431900, Library of Congress, control number 006486. If you go to the Library of Con Congress or contact the Library of Congress with this information, what it would lead you to is the book, The Desire of Ages. The desire, most persons say that, you know, the, and I thought that it was true until I did a little research on it, that it, the Desire of Ages, the Congress, had, Library of Congress had concluded that this was the most authoritative work on the life of Christ. But that is not actually true because the Library of Congress does not rate books like that. What they are, when they, a book is chosen for the Library of Con Congress, it is chosen that it is the book that would be more, most likely be asked about or requested. So that's one of the criteria that they use to choose a book. And they, even then, they recognize that this book will be of such value that it, it is, it is an often time requested book. So the more it is in print, the more it is read, and the more famous it becomes, then it would fit into one of the criteria to be in the Library of Congress. Now, you, you're... No, I'm saying that's one of the, when they look at the, it, it is like what they were saying that it's an estimate. How would this book be rated on the, or, or requested? So the demand the for quality the quality of the book is such that it, you would estimate that it would be in demand. So initially, right, initially when they cho chose a book, one of the criteria, and I'm saying is one, because I have not read all the criteria, but one of the criteria is that they are, Put place in, I would say, a, a bargain on the fact that this book is so well written that it would be an often time requested book. No, I'm not saying they have read it. Uh, remember, read I'm it. saying I'm not saying they have read it. But when a book in any subject matter comes about, obviously they must have their persons who who go through it, mm -hmm. do the research, and so and so. But what I'm saying, even though. They will not say they would rate the book as the most authoritative work on the life of Christ. This book is in the Library of Congress. Not, not many... Not all books make it to the Library of Congress. Not all books make it to the Library of Congress. And not, and not a whole lot of spiritual books. Not a whole lot of spiritual books make it to the Library of Congress. So for the desire of ages to make it, it's a little boost. I, 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 I would say it, 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 it is a little boost. Um, they said of the desire of ages, when you read the desire of ages, it said the desire of ages breathe a heavenly spirit. Here in the desire of ages, we come face to face with the Lord himself. Through the desire of ages and through no, as to no other book outside of the Bible, we may become intimately, intimately acquainted with our Savior, and his blessing will surely come to all who search its pages with hearts and minds that are receptive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And those of us here know I always talk that whenever you want to, want to understand Jesus' uh, life, Jesus' purpose, you go to Jesus in Gethsemane in Pilate's Judgment Hall, and Calvary in the Desire of Ages. When you finish those three chapters, if those three chapters have not moved your heart, something is wrong. So we are developing our book club, and our club is such that there are not specific leaders necessarily in the book club. We're all reading and we, we intend for all of us to share, to have discussions. So our intention is to break up the books in segments that we will do later. But how many of you have a copy of The Devi Desire of Ages at home? No. 
much. Well, that's, that's the great controversy. Okay. Yeah, I know they have. It, there's another book with another name that's the same content. I'm not quite sure which one that is, but you have one of those other ones. All right. And for those of us who don't have a book, we have a device with a little memory on it. Can, yes. We can download Ellen White app and we can download one book at a time and read the one book. And sometimes it will read for you. The voice on that is a little monotonous, but if it's even that, if your eye hurting you, Sister Ellen, if, <laughs> if, it's, if you need to multitask but you want to go back over the chapters, you can do that. Today, I know we did not have the information previously in order to ask you to bring your books, but for those of you who have it on your devices that you have here, can I see your hand? All right, awesome, oh, that's like a, a good amount of persons. So we're going to go through the preface. If you do not have it on your device, in the meantime, you could go, we have internet here. You could go to Play Store and download the EG White app and just download the one book for now, just the one book. And we can go through it. But while you're doing that, I'm going to ask for a testimony. But first, I'm going to share mine. Uh, we've all read the Gospels, heard the Gospels, and sometimes we miss little parts here and there. And when I decided to read The Desire of Ages previously, I was just awestruck. You, for me, I couldn't read any paragraph without just feeling, not the full depth, but how very deep Christ's love for me is and for us and how much he wants to save us and how much he did to save us and how much he's still doing. And it, it changed my heart. Desire of ages, you can't read it and your heart remains the same. I'm going to ask Elder Roach, share with us your thoughts, your experience with reading the Desire of Ages. I was saying that this, this is a book that I recommend to people for, for reading. And it's like, a, for them, if they have not read it, it's like a treasure out there that you need to find. Um, for me, the, the, the chapters that really touched me was Gethsemane and Calvary. It, is where, it, it was when I read Gethsemane and Calvary. Gethsemane, I will tell you this. Gethsemane and Calvary will make you cry. Literally cry. Yeah. Um, tears will come to your eye. Because one of the, the words, when Ellen White wrote the words, Jesus felt that his death, that sin was so terrible, that his death must be eternal. Yes? And that he could not see beyond the portals of the tomb. In other words, there's no resurrection. That, you know, that, is the time I, that was the time I understood the sacrifice that Jesus did for us. In other words, willing to die eternally. He who knows no beginning from no end is now willing to die eternally for me. That is when I grasped the love of Jesus Christ for me. And that's why Calvary and Gethsemane, anytime I, I, I recommend a book to people or anyone, I say, please read Gethsemane and Calvary. Yes? Um, that is my, that is my uh, those are my two favorite chapters in the Buddhist of Ages. Can you, can you tell that Elder Roach was touched, not just by what he said, but by how he said it. All right. So, Auntie Carla, our idea is 